Hello, this is Public Advocate, and I'm Shirley mm -hmm. Graves. We have a very interesting uh, show for you uh, right now. We have two people here, and the issues are going to revolve around animals in several different ways. Uh, uh, animals as food, uh, uh, treatment of animals, and rodeos. We're going to hear some interesting things about rodeos, rodeos, to get this mm -hmm. right here. <laughs> and um, I would like to introduce my guests. I have Patty Brightman. Uh, of Marin County, who is a, a member of the Marin Vegetarian Education Group. So she's going to talk about um, food and, and your diet and whatnot and what we eat. And uh, uh, this is wonderful. I've been a vegetarian for longer than I'd like to discuss. <laughs> and, and it certainly has done me a lot of good. And uh, our guest on this side is Eric Mills, who is a uh, author and publisher of a wonderful monthly newsletter, uh, Action for Animals, that, that deals with uh, uh, animal events and uh, animal things going on uh, that, uh, in politics and all kinds of wonderful things. And we're going to have uh, both of them tell us what they do and tell you how to get in touch with them if you want uh, hmm, copies of a book they've written or copies of their, their newsletter. So. Um, who wants to start and tell us a little bit about your background and uh... <laughs> I'll start. Okay. Yep. okay. I'm Patty Brightman and I run the Marin Vegetarian Education Group mm -hmm. and I'd like to invite anyone who's interested in getting a monthly email newsletter to write to me at eatplants at earthlink.net. Eatplants at earthlink.net and just once a month I send a newsletter of interest to people who are vegetarians or moving toward vegan. We'll give that Good. address later in the program after everybody's gone and got a pencil too. Okay. So, okay? <laughs> so I like to use the phrase moving toward vegan because even vegetarians that I know are moving toward vegan and that we're finding that the animals raised for their <laughs> eggs and for their milk are treated even worse than those that are raised for their flesh. So even if you gave yes. up eating chickens and you gave up eating fish and you gave up eating red meat, but you still eat eggs and dairy, the animals are treated horribly. And the numbers are amazing. It's just amazing. The amount of suffering in the egg-laying hens' lives and in oh. the dairy cows' lives is just unspeakable. I've read about that It's in unspeakable. Mm -hmm. So we encourage people to move toward vegan. Not everyone can do it overnight. Not everyone wants to do it suddenly. But mm -hmm. eventually mm -hmm. eating, even when you have a coffee, if you go to a coffee shop and you decide, I won't put milk in my coffee today, I'll have almond milk or soy milk mm -hmm. or rice milk or coconut milk. We always have mm -hmm. almond milk. I can't tell the mm -hmm. difference, really. Well, so. that's it. And, mm -hmm. and you're really helping to end the suffering of dairy cows when you do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, very briefly, I'll say I just visited my mom in Florida, who's 89, God bless oh. her. <laughs> and she was surprised to learn that cows don't give milk. Oh. The same <laughs> way that humans program. don't give milk. Yeah, cows are mammals, and every mammal, every mammal, including humans and cows, only produce milk when they've had a baby. Mm -hmm. And the milk is intended for the baby. So from an ethical standpoint, we're stealing the milk when we take it to make ice cream or cheese yes. or yogurt. Like the mother behind you. Like the mother behind <laughs> me, exactly. On Mother's Day, a lot of people boycott dairy because the industry is so cruel. They take the baby away from the mother within days of birth, and they both cry for each other, scream for each other, yes. look for each other. It's heartbreaking, even on so-called humane farms, organic farms, yes. free-range farms, grass-fed. It happens all the time because we need the milk for the industry. Yeah, and then the commercial is everybody needs milk. It's not true, it's a lie to sell the product and abuse these animals. Right, so. well everybody does need milk when we're babies. Yep. We're the only species that continues to drink it when we're not babies, and it's not our own species milk. It's very bizarre that we've come to depend on milk when yes. we're past the age of weaning. <laughs> well, and, and well, if mothers nursed the babies, you wouldn't need to, to, to get, give cow's milk to them. Right. So. Okay. I want to say what I really find most encouraging in all of this, most people do care once they learn what the facts are. I read that back in the height of the Vietnam War, Washington was getting more letters about animal welfare combined than the war itself. So people do have a heart for animals and if we just educate them we can change a lot of this. Right, a lot of people can make kinder choices and it doesn't really change your lifestyle today. For sure. You can order at any Starbucks or any other, I don't like Starbucks particularly, but any coffee mm -hmm. shop now has soy milk, rice yep. milk, almond milk mm -hmm. and it's just as easy to have a latte made with a non-harming, non-cruel choice for your milk. Wow. So, well, well, Eric, good work. You have you have a, a different view that, uh, or a different direction you're looking at some of this? 
a bit. Uh, my name is yeah, Eric Mills. I'm coordinator of Action for Animals since 1984. Mm -hmm. My dear departed friend, Virginia Hanley, who was the California coordinator of Action for uh, the Fund for Animals for many years, used to joke that Action for Animals, that sounds like a dating service for poodles. <laughs> so I thought it was good. And Virginia, bless her heart, was also an actress. She did, I uh, saw uh, Glass Menagerie right here in Novato. And she played the lead in Tennessee Williams play. W wonderful person and the best animal activist I've ever known. She died three years ago this month. So, she's still here. Uh, I spend a lot of my time on rodeo issues. I, I think there's a sea change going on in the country right now about our use and misuse of animals in entertainment. We had San Francisco, not San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles and Oakland both banned the use of bull hooks on elephants. Mm -hmm. uh, then it became a state law. Ringling Brothers, after 147 years, went belly up, RIP. Uh, SeaWorld has banned the orca shows, killer whales, and the breeding thereof. Rodeo is a, in that same ballpark. People in other words, all the letters that some of us wrote to those establishments did some good. Big time. <laughs> and, and thank God, or the powers that be, for the, the documentary Blackfish. That inspired Assemblyman Richard Bloom to introduce the state bill. And it changed his life. It changed the life of these animals. Mm -hmm. Some the most social, I mean, Female orcas never leave their parents throughout life, so they're kept in a concrete box about as big as this room doing stupid tricks for an insensitive audience. It, it's just insane. Poor old Tillicum, who just died recently, killed three people, and he scalped and dismembered one of them. You think he was having fun? I'm sure that the victim was not. So animals should not be in captivity like that. 27 countries around the world have banned uh, wild animals in circuses and carnivals. Mm -hmm. Mexico, uh, Bolivia, Colombia, uh, Iran, of all places. Where are we? A bill was just introduced last week in the U.S. Congress by uh, Lee Hallward from Arizona to outlaw the use of circus animals, wild animals in circuses throughout the land. Hopefully it will pass this time. Yeah. We shall see. And there's a story you sent me from the Washington Post that has a story about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I just read that story and wrote to Jared Huffman. Good for you. I forwarded him a link to the story and said, please support this bill. Yeah. Jer yeah. Jared's a good man. So, and if you're not political, I think you're dead to water. I mean, we have to do it all. But back to the rodeo issue, which I've been working on for about 30 years now. It's really hot this week. I was just interviewed yesterday morning by KGO Television, and Fox News picked it up, and it's gone national, which I thought was oh pretty funny. But uh, Woodside, where they have the junior rodeo right down the peninsula here, with a lot more money than good sense, I think, sometimes. But for 50 years now, the Mounted Patrol has put on a 4th of July junior rodeo which features, as part of the entertainment, pig scrambles. Uh, you can see a couple of photos up here. And they had three shifts of kids, maybe 40 to 50 of them, ages four to seven years old, chasing about 15 baby pigs. The pigs are terrified. The kids are screaming and hollering. They get picked up by the ears and the legs and jumped on. And what a terrible message to send to children about the proper treatment right. of animals. At the same rodeo, they have a petting zoo and a uh, pony ride, carefully monitored. I think that's fine. So the kids interact, be kind to animals, and then they go to the, the arena and do this. I just find it extraordinary. Not only that, I think it's a violation of state law. The, the State Education Code 60042 mandates that humane education and kindness to animals be taught in the public schools mm -hmm. K through 12. Mm. So, not to say that these kids would grow up to be Jeffrey Dahmers, but it's still a, a terrible message. And the schools of all places should not be saying this is a good idea. Mm -hmm. It is not. So we had this hearing in uh, Woodside on Wednesday night. I mean, you could smell the testosterone. Cowboy hats wall to wall, and they're all in their uniforms. And nice folks. Uh, when I spoke, I said I was going to wear my Dale Evans outfit tonight. I thought they would give all the cowboys a heart attack, but I, I didn't. <laughs> you didn't wear it. No. no but oh, three of the... There are seven members on the city council, and three of them recused themselves. One of them, because only she lived next door to the mounted patrol. I said, that's crazy. Stay here and hear the testimony. But in their wisdom, and then about 25 people spoke, including a couple of veterinarians, three children. Now, this was a, what, a council, city councilor? Yeah, a town council meeting. In Woodside. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we were hoping that they would do a, a ban on this event, not to affect the rest of the mm -hmm. rodeo. They had the junior rodeo with all their sanctioned events. But this one particular event is bad for the pigs. Uh, Animal Place did an online petition. They collected 
26,000 signatures from around the world in less than three weeks. Wow. And I told the council, I said, people are going to start boycotting your town if you're not careful. Right. I said, you're seen as a compassionate, progressive, educated community. Mm -hmm. And yet then the cowboys come in. And one of the cowboys testifies says, oh, baby pigs, it's no big deal. They're going to be whole roasted in two weeks anyway. <laughs> I said, oh, so it's okay to abuse them before we eat them then, huh? That's, that's the message. Well, we had some serious debate. Only two people from the uh, Mounted Patrol spoke. And I love the fact, too, it's men only. They were sued 30 years ago to let women in, lost the court case. And rather than let women join the Mounted Patrol, they uh, divested their connections with the county sheriff's department, so now it's still men only. What's a mounted patrol? Is it, is they get, they're usually former policemen quite often, mm -hmm. and they're from all seven Bay Area counties, and the, the patrolmen are, as well as the children, so they come from all over. I got some criticism for, not, for speaking out, up out of place, since I'm from Oakland, and I said, what if it's Nazi Germany? I'm supposed to shut up? No. Animal abuse knows no borders. We have to speak up all the time. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't care if it's Mother Teresa or God, I'm gonna be on a picket line if somebody's out there abusing animals. And every humane society in the country thinks that all of rodeo really is abusive and should be stopped. Mm -hmm. And that's what the cowboys are worried about. This is just a slippery slope. So if we help these pigs today, we're all gonna be communists tomorrow. That's the thinking. <laughs> well, you know, what your, your case against rodeos has a lot, and animal abuse and animals and entertainment, it's very similar to the case of not eating animals because basically it's an entire worldview where animals are commodities. Yes. Instead of being beings, sentient beings mm -hmm. with their own feelings and their own ability to feel pain and their own ability to suffer and to feel hurt and loss and grieve when loved ones disappears, they are living beings and basically our society is set up to treat them like commodities. We don't have any respect whatsoever for their feelings or for their exactly. relationships or for their very existence. And then when we eat them, we don't have the decency to say, this is pig, this is cow, this is calf, it's pork, it's beef, it's veal. Exactly. So there's a distance from it. The saddest story, and maybe the funniest, I was at a, a meeting up in the Oakland Hills maybe 10 years ago, they were doing some rodeo issues up there steer wrestling, which they weren't supposed to do. And so we had some hearings. A uh, young woman from inner Oakland, African-American, brought a little boy, about six years old, I guess. And he was amazed to see that chickens had only two legs. He thought they had six, because that's what mama bought home from Safeway. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. That's so out of touch we are. Kid had never seen a chicken. Didn't know what a chicken was. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They could have had six legs. And well, had kids had grow fun. up eating nuggets and don't even realize it comes from a chicken. They oh. call it nuggets. Yeah, oh, they grow on a McDonald's tree with, with the happy cows. It's very sad. Well, yeah, you're going that way. You call, when you eat a bowl of, uh, of uh, cow and vegetables, you don't call it cow and vegetables, you call it stew. Mm. Uh, <laughs> same, same, same thing what you're saying. Right. You, you don't say, I'm eating meat. It's exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. kids know thing. better. Kids know better. I mean, children who understand don't want to eat the animals. When I was about three years old, I don't remember this, but I'm told this, it's lore in my family. <laughs> I was playing with a chicken all day at a farm. And that night we were eating dinner and my mother says to me, the chicken we're eating is the chicken you were racing up and down with the fence, uh, at the, oh. alongside the fence today. And I started crying and I wouldn't eat. I bet. I absolutely wouldn't eat and started crying. And I got the normal, I'm told, I was told, well, some animals are to eat and some animals are to play with. And that's just an arbitrary thing we say to, pro to promote the myth that it's important to eat animal protein. Now you just revealed to us why you're a vegetarian. But you know what? I, I wasn't a vegetarian. That was when I was three years no, old. No, I said I this, be, but, but I didn't become a vegetarian until I was 31 years well, old. Well, it's, it's a lot of different uh, issues pile on top of each other. Yeah. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Same yeah. way I can, you know, recall yeah. myself. Yeah. Along those same lines, I was having a private conversation with a member of the board of the Hayward Area Rec and Park District. And a woman is reminiscing about her childhood, a third generation rancher, how she always had baby chicks for pets when she was a kid. They were so cute and smelled so good. She pet their little heads and slept with them. And then they grew up and we ate them. Just that <laughs> flip. I said, Carol, I said, maybe when you cross through those pearly gates, which seems rather doubtful to me, you can have a sit down with God and those chickens about how you abused them in their youth. She said, oh, animals don't go to heaven. I said, well, Pope Francis says that they do, yeah. and so did Pope Paul VI. Yeah. And if they don't, then by God, they deserve the best possible life we can give them before we eat them. Don't they? Don't they? Oh. She didn't want to talk about it. She didn't. Which I just ran across a great quote. You probably know Dr. Temple Grandin. Mm -hmm. She is an animal behaviorist, world-renowned. 
right. And she also suffers from autism. Mm -hmm. She spent a lot of time in a squeeze chute just mm -hmm. to make her feel normal. Uh, she's done a lot of work on this. I just ran across this extraordinary quote. People need to keep in mind that all rodeo animals, for rodeo is just a detour en route to the slaughterhouse. Horses, bulls, calves, steers, all of them, they're going to slaughter, pigs in this case. But Ms. Grandin had a statement. In assessing criteria for suffering, psychological stress, which is fear stress, should be considered as important as suffering induced by pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That cow, that's abuse, just by definition. Absolutely. And the cowboys don't want to hear, all the animals are having a great time. This is the, probably the best day of their life. One of these poor cows two years ago at the Rail Ranch Rodeo in Hayward separated from her baby. They're all unweaned, and so that's a lot of stress. And these guys manhandled her. And then she jumped the fence, landed on her head, broke her neck, had to be euthanized, left an orphan calf. And one of the cowboys testified at a hearing that we called shortly thereafter. Well, the cow that got killed, she was suicidal. I said, mister, were you born stupid? Have you been practicing? That's the <laughs> dumbest thing I've heard this week. Well, it got dumber. Anyway, the Hayward Area Rec and Park District, in its wisdom, had a subcommittee meeting last week whether to send this issue to the full board. They're doing button busting, and the wild cow milking contest has nothing to do with the real rodeo, and they could get rid of them very easily. But the subcommittee voted not to send it to the full board, so they're going to go ahead and do this. I think they're going to be looking at some serious lawsuits. Oh, they're still going to go ahead and do it. They're yes. having it. Explain what mutton Ooh. busting is. Then. Oh, uh, there's, there's a, a picture. picture over, here's yeah. a picture there. It's children aged four to seven years old coerced into riding terrified sheep. Quite often, the kids are in tears. A little boy, I know, and parents really need to take heed on this one. A little boy in Texas, three years old, named Bubba Kirby, I think. It was in, on the Google. Got a mouthful of arena dirt. All rodeo arenas are full of E. coli. This kid developed a serious infection, went into a two-week coma, suffered heart, lung, and kidney failure, swelled up twice his normal size, and damn near died for fun. Oh, he did live through it all. Yeah, I don't know. He'll have health problems the rest of his well, life. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I think in any what condition? Yeah. Yeah. I think any parent who allows this should be cited for child endangerment as well as animal abuse. The two yeah. are the same. But we don't think of it as animal abuse when we think of it as entertainment. And we don't think of it as animal abuse when we think of it as food. You have to start reframing it yeah. as torturing animals. Yeah. The key word there is think. Well, there you go. The rodeo fans don't think. They come out there for a good time. I enjoy seeing the animals, they too. They think money. There you go. That's what I And they say they love animals, and they're always concerned when the animals get hurt. I said, yeah, but the possibility is always there. Well, the cowboys get hurt more often. I said, yes, but they choose to they be choose, there. They choose, exactly. The animals do not. They're all going to slaughter. And calf roping, should, people should be in jail for calf roping. These are baby animals, quite often jerked over backwards. I was at the Salinas Rodeo in 1995 when five animals were killed in the one weekend. One, a roping calf with a broken back. They did not euthanize. They sent, trucked him off to slaughter, yeah. terrified and in agony. Uh, I asked the veterinarian there, Dr. Gary Dieter, now retired, uh, did you get any painkillers? Oh, no, that ruins the meat for human consumption. I said, you so excuse me. I said, your license should have been revoked for malpractice. You let that baby suffer for two days to save $125 when your damn rodeo brings in $13 million to Salinas every year. It's always about the money. Mm -hmm. This country does not understand morality very well, but it knows no. money very well. Yes, I think you're right. And also, animals raised for food are also killed as babies. Yes. We're eating babies all the time. Yes. Veal calves are a sad a side effect calves. of the dairy industry. If the cow has to be pregnant to give milk, and then she gets pregnant, we impregnate her artificially, violently, artificial insemination by virtually raping her every 12 months. And every nine months she has a baby, and the baby's taken away from her. The male baby is a veal calf. And those calves aren't supposed to be, they want tender flesh, so they don't let them move around a lot. Right. And they don't mm -hmm. give them any nutrition so that the right. flesh is pale, they're anemic. Yes. And then we kill them as babies. And even some of the female cows are killed as babies. And right. even adult cows, because we bred them to give so much milk that they can't spend the normal lifespan giving. I say giving in yeah. quotes because they're not really giving milk, mm -hmm. we're taking yeah. it from them. The udders are unreal. The udders are unreal. Yeah. Right. And we, we breed them to be able to give more milk than is natural. Mm -hmm. And then we kill them when they're still babies. They don't get to live to adulthood.
we better pray karma is not true. <laughs> Every year in this country, we eat about 10 billion animals with a B. Not That's only not land counting, animals. Not counting fish. And 85% oh of the pharmaceuticals we produce in this country are force fed to farm animals with serious health results for those animals and the people who eat them. It's truly a nightmare for the critters. They deserve better and so do we. There's going to be some heavy dues to pay if we keep on doing this. And it's not just us and it's not just the animals. The environment is suffering too because Big all time. of these animals produce poop and they urinate and all of that feces has to go somewhere. And unlike human waste that has treatment plants in most cities, these are huge cities worth of animals everywhere with no treatment plants. Mm -hmm. And pig farms in the south, when there's a big storm, these holding pens of water, they have big lakes. They have reservoirs, they call them, but they're, they're yes. lakes of manure. And when a storm comes, that manure is just spread far and wide, goes into our drinking water, the groundwater, and to get rid of some of it, you know those sprinklers that go and they go in both directions? To get rid of the manure, they, they add it to water and they spray it on land and the neighbors get higher rates of cancer and the neighbors get higher rates of asthma and it stinks to high heaven and we're doing this to ourselves. We're ruining our own environment. We're the only species that really s spoils and I want to use a cruder word but we're on television. Yeah, we're, the yeah, only, yeah. we're the only species that, that lives in a filthy environment of our own making. Yeah. And yet we call ourselves homo sapiens. Talk about chutzpah. There's a wonderful the wise new book. One. <laughs> There's a wonderful new book I just finished reading. Fantastic book called *Sapiens*, and it's a history of humankind. And clearly, the author cares about animals. I read the um, afterward before I read the book, and I fell in love with his idea of how the world is hurting animals. Mm -hmm. And then I read the whole book, and it's a very, very, very big, very interesting book about the history of *Homo sapiens* and what we're doing to the planet. Looks interesting. We're the the only self-destructive animal on the planet and the most destructive otherwise with the eternal war it never ends. I just read another one of E.O. Wilson's books, you know, the, the Harvard biologist, mm -hmm. Pulitzer Prize winner. He's an eternal optimist, but in this book two years ago maybe called The Meaning of Human Existence. I've always wondered what it was too. And he says right in the middle of this book, we as a species are in, in innately dysfunctional. And it's true, we it's can't true. keep up with the technology and with folks tweeting all kinds of god-awful stuff around the world. I know. The whole planet is in serious jeopardy right now. We need to do better. We're losing about 30,000 species of plants and animals per year due to us. Not evolution, right. us. And now some idiot scientist is trying to bring back a bunch of woolly mammoths. Why not protect what we have now? Can you imagine being a mammoth living in Oakland today? <laughs> Come on. I want to say, though, I want to say that it's easier than people think to start looking at the world from the perspective of we are one of the animals rather than we are here to control the animals and use the animals. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to make that switch. It's just a matter of remembering when you were a child how you felt about animals. Most people when they're children care about animals. Yes. They and don't want to hurt animals. Until it's educated out of them in the public school system. It's educated and not just the school system. Our parents tell us that it's natural yes. to eat animals. And the army tells us it's natural. Every institution, every school, every institution, our parents, they tell us it's normal, it's natural, it's necessary. And questioning that is scary. And yet, more and more people are. I want to do a plug for my book. May, may I oh, plug my book? Please tell us about your book. I yes, wrote a book a called book How to Eat Like a Vegetarian, Even If You Never Want to Be One. And this is a wonderful, <laughs> well, the thing is, we don't need more labels. We don't need to call ourselves a vegetarian. We can just say, I'm eating lower on the food chain, or I'm eating less cholesterol, or I'm eating an animal kind diet. You don't have to label yourself. And this is why I love the even if you never want to be one. Just say, I don't eat meat. I don't eat meat. And this book has not only recipes, what I love about this book isn't just that it has recipes that are good. It has lists, lists of 10 things. Mm -hmm. Lists of 10 ways to eat more vegetables, 10 ideas for what to do with chickpeas, 10 ways to eat more dark leafy greens. And I say that because dark leafy greens are powerhouses of nutrition. They're mm -hmm. one of the best foods mm -hmm. there are. 10 ways to ha make a sandwich, 10 ideas for <laughs> lunch, 10 things to eat when there's nothing in the house. It has all kinds of <laughs> lists of how easy it can be to just get the animals off your plate. So it's available wherever books are sold. How, and how to eat, eat like, like a, a vegetarian. vegetarian even if you never want to be one. And it's by Carol Adams and Patty Brightman. Ta-da. Ta yes. Congratulations. Thank not you. only will you feel better, you will sleep better with a clear conscience. It does you know? feel this, better uh, to not be harming animals. When does we one eat. call the bookstore or are there special places well, to get this? Or the call best you? Online, or? No, online with any online bookstore. Barnes & Noble has it. Amazon has it. Ah. But any bookstore can order it. So Super. if you go to, I prefer the local bookstores. Book Passage can order it for you. 
and I'm sure Copperfields can order it for you in Novato. I mean, it's, a, it's out there, it's available. How to eat like a vegetarian, even if you never wanted to be one. <laughs> even if you don't want to admit you are one, right? Exactly, and then I have one other book I'll plug. Good. For those of us over 50, I don't know if anyone at this table is, no. I don't know if anyone watching is, <laughs> but if you are over 50, I also co-authored a book called Never Too Late to Go Vegan. Mm -hmm. And the reason I wrote this is, a lot of animal activists want the biggest bang for the buck that they can get. If they're gonna be protesting rodeos and circuses and telling people why they shouldn't be eating animals, they wanna get people to change their viewpoint. And they think the younger you are when you change your viewpoint, the more animals you'll save over your lifetime. So Good quite point. a few young people say, don't bother trying to tell anyone over 50 to become a vegetarian <laughs> or a vegan because they only have so many years left <laughs> to save animals. If you go to the college campuses, you'll have people changing for their whole lives. Well, there is some truth to that, and college campuses are changing faster than any other segment of the population. Most colleges now have vegan options at every meal in every dining hall. It's changing. But I resented, and I, I did not like that we were being written off as a generation, like, oh, the baby boomers forget them. It's too late for them. Yeah. So we wrote this book to show the stories of a lot of people who are over 50, well over 50, who decided to change to a vegan diet or move toward a vegan diet. That's super. Not so long ago, vegetarianism was, you were probably a communist if you were, and now vegans is going mainstream. I think exactly. it's extraordinary. Exactly. And it helps the planet, it helps the animals, it helps you. Exactly. Everybody and, wins. And my co-author on this book is, well, on both books, Carol J. Adams is a brilliant philosopher and feminist and yes. activist who wrote the book, The Sexual Politics of Meat and talks about how women and meat are both marketed by exploiting them sexually. The breasts and the legs, and she shows the ads of how they sell chicken and how they sell meat, and she shows the misogyny in the industries that, have, that raise hens to lay eggs and breeds cows to give milk. And she talks about if, if you're a feminist and if you care about women's rights and female rights, you'll, you wanna care about the animals who are females also. That's a good lead in for this. I have an yes. extraordinary quote from a steer wrestler in Wyoming, 1982. Women should not rodeo any more than men can have babies. Women were put on earth to reproduce and are close to animals. Women's liberation is on an equal to gay liberation. They're both ridiculous. It just takes your breath away, doesn't it? Well, and it's in the language. I love Carol Adams' work. I've always thought sexism and animal abuse were two sides of the same coin. Think of all the perfectly good words that come from animals that are applied to women in a derogatory way. Pussy, beaver, dog, bitch, cow. You know? it's true. That's what Carol Adams, her life work is showing that. Yes, okay. and our movement is still 85% female. I didn't know that. And Our what our, is? The animal movement. Oh, oh. The movement oh, really? to protect animals. I didn't know yeah. that. I didn't that's know that That's about right. Either. And probably 99% white and middle class. That has to change. But it just shows that people of color are quite often so desperate, they're just trying to get food on the table and a place to live. Mm -hmm. So we have to reach out to all of these folks and make this. And well, that, that brings me to the whole idea of exploitation and the whole idea that it doesn't matter what exploitation is. We've always, as a, as a people, we have a terrible history of always thinking of someone as the other. And mm -hmm. then as soon as we can make them an other, we can dismiss them. And we do, we, I wanted to say oppression. Oppression of women, oppression of animals, oppression of gay people, oppression of people of color. It's all the same. It's of a piece. It's of a piece. It's a mindset that we are not all in this together, that somehow people who are different from us or beings who are different from us are less worthy <coughs> than we are. And that's a mindset that really can't, shouldn't survive. I can't, it may survive. Okay. I hope it doesn't. I'm glad you raised that. If I may not bore you with one more quote, this is one of my most treasured items. It's a letter I got from Cesar Chavez back in 1990. And I so, understand he was quite a, 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 a animal-related person. Yes, and his followers do not know this. I met the great man twice. He told me that he was a uh, vegetarian for ethical reasons, that, yeah. not mm -hmm. health, mm -hmm. ethical, as was his 87-year-old mother at the time. And his followers don't know this. Tomorrow is his birthday. It's a state holiday. It should be a national holiday, of course. And every year I circulate this letter throughout the Capitol, I said, you guys do a lot of lip service for Cesar, but you do not practice what he preached. It's all a shuck and jive. Share if you letter. want to go crazy, go Let to Sacramento. But here's an excerpt from it. It was written to me the day after Christmas, 1990, President of the United Farm Workers, Cesar Chavez. Kindness and compassion towards all living things is a mark of a civilized society. 
Conversely, cruelty, whether directed against human beings or against animals, it's not the exclusive province of any one culture or community of people. Racism, economic deprival, dogfighting, cockfighting, bullfighting, and rodeos are all cut from the same fabric, violence. Only when we've become nonviolent towards all life will we have learned to live well ourselves. Isn't that extraordinary? And of course, he was a disciple of Gandhi, as was G.B. Shaw. So. There is tremendous violence in the food industry. There's violence in the animals and entertainment, rodeos, circuses. All of those SeaWorld, not just SeaWorld, there are other smaller enterprises mm -hmm. that do the yeah. same thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely horrendous and what when, we do to living beings, yeah. sent, sentient yeah. beings. Yeah. And when those circus animals are not performing stupid tricks on command, they're kept either chained or in tiny cramped cages. A lot of them become neurotic. The constant travel, Ringling Brothers mm -hmm. was traveling with two units 48 weeks out of the year. The animals are insane, and most of them are endangered species. Well, even before that, they capture them sometimes by killing the adults and just stealing the yeah. babies so they can train them from when they're a baby. Yeah, we're still doing that. It's heartbreaking. But the real religious folks really need to take uh, a lead on this, and they're not. I fault them strongly for that. That's why I love the Pope so much. Yes. But if this is God's creation, we have a duty and an obligation. I mean, the Bible says dominion. That doesn't mean screw over. It means stewardship to take care of, right? There's a wonderful book called Dominion. You know about that yes. book by Matthew Scully? Yes. He was a speechwriter for President Reagan. Bush. Bush, President Bush. Uh, it said wonderful things about animals. And yes, he wrote a whole book called Dominion about what it means to have dominion. And he's calling on Christians to not think that dominion means we have power over. It yeah. means we have the duty to protect. Yeah. Yeah. And while we're pushing books, I hope yes. everybody has read Pope Francis Encyclical. It came out in 2015. It's Encyclical on Climate Change and Inequality. There are at least a dozen wonderful quotes in here uh, favoring animals. And I was just telling uh, a minute ago that I'd written to the Pope a few months back asking him to do a papal edict condemning the inherent cruelty of rodeos Chariotas, the Mexican rodeo, and bullfights. I said, I can make you famous. I can make you ha famous. Haven't heard back yet. You said that oh to the my, Pope, I can I, make you yes. famous. <laughs> when I've read about him, you're probably going to hear back, though. I might. Show the book to Because he says everything. Camera. It's a wonderful book. It's only 15 bucks at your local bookstore. Uh, the guy, he is a saint, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, and he's, he's from Argentina, and he knows science. And then I just heard that Al Gore has a sequel coming out for his uh, Film about climate change. Which well, this time I hope he talks about raising animals for food because he left I would that out so. of the first one. He's been educated about this about now, so uh -huh. I hope we will. There's so much ignorance coming out of Washington right now, it's really desperate that we get this out there. So buy this book and those also. Patty will give you a <laughs> discount. I wanted to say something else about um, animals raised for food. There's a movement now, especially in Marin County, but there's a movement now that says, I only buy happy cow meat, or I only buy eggs from yeah. chickens that had a good life, I've seen that. or I only buy milk from cows that were, you know, only had one bed, you know, that they're, they're treated well while they live, so it's okay. When I became a vegan in 1986, the only option, if you didn't want to support factory farms and you didn't want to support cruelty to animals, the only option you had was to go vegan. That's still true today. But the marketing of the animal industry is so successful that people think they can buy what's called humane pro animal products. And that's just a contradiction in terms. It's an oxymoron. There are no humane animal right. products. It's not true. The baby is still taken away from the mother. The noses are still clipped on the birds. Cage-free doesn't mean anything. Where it means you're not in an individual cage, but if you see a photograph of those warehouses with tens of thousands of birds in a giant building, yeah. the stench of ammonia is so bad that the workers who go in have to wear hazmat suits. I was in one of those in the Central Valley about 15 years ago. As you say, the stench nearly knocked me down. And they had five and six chickens in a cage. They're there for two years. Some of them had their feet going into the cage. They couldn't even move. No veterinary care whatsoever. They come by every week or so and pick out the dead birds and then they have forced molting where they starve the chickens for a week they lose all their feathers then growing back the ones who survive have another egg laying cycle then when that's done it's all off to McDonald's but even in the so-called humane operations the so-called free range the so-called organic mm -hmm. It's not much better. Even if they're out of cages, they're in a warehouse where they still can't move. And, and what qualifies as free range, they can have one door for a shed of 10,000 birds, yeah. one little door. And, and when they go out, very few of them do go out. They can't get right. to the door. And even if they do, there's not any 
healthy grass for them to peck right. at. All of the things that are natural to animals are deprived of them when we raise them for food. Birds naturally like to peck, they like to scratch, they like to take dust baths, they like yeah. to um, <clears throat> build social communities, they have a pecking order. None of that is allowed. We deprive them of their very nature of what yes. the animal is Most when we, when we the raise them. Day. You became a vegetarian or vegan in 1987. 85 I became a vegetarian and then I moved to California. I was in New York at the time. Because I did too, in, in, I think it was about 87. That's funny, I yeah. was in New York in 1985 and I was an editor for, yeah. and I edited a book called Fit for Life. It was a diet book by Harvey and Marilyn Diamond. Ooh. And Harvey said something I'll never forget in that book. He said, if you put a baby in a crib with an apple and a rabbit, if that baby eats the rabbit and plays with the apple, I'll buy you a new car. I'll buy you a new car. And that was the first time I ever thought about that naturally we're not drawn to meat. He no. said, if we were natural carnivores, we would salivate when a cow walked by. If we saw a lamb walking by, we would be hungry and salivating. Instead, we want to pet it. We want to mm. cuddle with it. It's mm. just, he really changed my whole view. Mm. And I became a vegetarian, but when I moved to California a year later, everyone said, why are you still drinking milk? Why are you still eating eggs? And I said, come on, I made the biggest change in my life. Don't get on my case. You know, it's enough already. I'm a vegetarian. They said, well, read a book by John Robbins called Diet for a New yeah, America. I know that. So I read that book and overnight I could no longer, I, I got sick to my stomach when I saw cheese. As much as I love cheese and I crave cheese and I was addicted yeah. to cheese, that book made me think you can't do this to animals, no taste is worth it. And now, thank goodness, especially in Marin County or the Bay Area, we have so many vegan cheeses that are so good. Mm -hmm. That's true. Miyoko's cheese is unbelievable and she's a local Marin County woman who has a whole line of fabulous cheese based with nuts and they're fermented and they taste Really, people who do eat dairy cheese can't tell the difference. They yeah. love her cheeses. Well, that's wonderful. I was just reminded a bit off the subject in the movie South Pacific when they talk about racism. It said you have to be taught, carefully mm -hmm. taught. It's like this. If you start them young and give them the facts and show them the options, people will make the right choices instead mm -hmm. of having it forced upon you. On that same note, a bit of good news on the animal front. Four years ago, I think, the, our California State Fair had an exhibit in the animal nursery of three pregnant sows in farrowing crates. They were right there. You could stick your arm right up the birth canal if you wanted to. The crates are about this big. They cannot turn around. They can barely stand up. No bedding. Mm -hmm. In there for three weeks, forced to give birth on a metal grid with nightly fireworks. Mm -hmm. They had uh, third year vet students there from UC Davis talking to the crowd and saying how wonderful this was. I thought people would be utterly appalled. They were not. And this one young woman got through her spiel. Said, anybody have any questions? No, sir. Yes, sir. I said, yes, ma'am. Can you spell bullsh? And I said the whole thing. <gasps> I said, you are lying to this audience. You have betrayed your morals. You've been lied to by your professors. It's all about money to save more pigs to raise to adulthood. In the wild, these animals would be building a nest away from other people and other animals in the dark. If you did this to a dog, they would put your sorry behind in jail tonight. And the state law, 597T, they're being sued now thanks to ALDF and me, requires that any animal confined this way has to have room to move. Mm -hmm. So it's breaking the law, it's breaking all human common decency. You Hogs are smarter than dogs. I it, know. As, it doesn't matter if you're stupid or not. I mean, come on. Now wait, uh, you mentioned But here comes the good news. Okay, yes please. Uh, we went and about the same time that poor cow got away from the nursery, and was called a couple times and then they, she broke away again and the attending county sheriff ordered her shot. She was looking for a place to deliver her calf. Mm. They shot her 11 times, not in the head, so body shot, so she bled to death and she and the baby died, so major demo up there finally. And then shortly thereafter, I went to the California State Board meetings they meet once every month. Hardly anybody goes to these things and people can really make a difference. Woody Allen says 80% of life is showing up. So yeah. we showed up. And they saw our calls, last three years, no hogs in farrowing crates at all. Also, at my request, after a lot of badgering, 
bad word. Uh, they got rid of the goldfish vendors, saving 15,000 goldfish every year. They had a vendor named Jungle George selling raccoon and beaver on a stick. I remember that. And I saw, they had him on a grill, it looked like a dog, teeth, eyes and everything. People were lined up, all these macho guys trying to impress their girlfriends. I called the health department, I said, did you approve this? I said, yeah. I said, you do know that raccoons are notorious for carrying distemper and rabies and roundworms and hookworm. And I said, where did the meat come from? Please tell me at least it's roadkill. No, it's from fur farms out of state. I said, damn it, fur farms are illegal in California. And yet you do this. What is the matter with us? I know. Quite a lot. Yes, anyway, so they got rid of Jungle George. Thank goodness. That's good news. And thanks to your good work. And others have helped. And now we have the most humane state fair in the country. I just got a note from... Uh, Rick Pickering, who's the CEO, mm -hmm. who used to be CEO at the Alameda County Fair, he said no fairing crates this year Thank either goodness. and hopefully in the future. Every small step helps. So That's I, beautiful. I said we'll make you famous. So I'll send it to all the groups around the country and other fairs to follow suit. Great. And, but you mentioned ALDF. I want to tell yes. people what that is, the Animal Legal Defense mm -hmm. Fund. What I love about the Animal Legal Defense Fund is one of the ads they ran that made me pay attention to them and now I'm a donor and I give to them every month. They had an ad that said, we're the only law firm on the planet where every client is innocent. I love that line. I, I love that. They basically go to court mm -hmm. to make sure that animals aren't being abused. They help pass laws, they help enforce laws, and they help fight for animal rights when animal rights are being disregarded. Yeah. Now, they're based in Marin? They're, no, they're not in Marin, but they're in uh, Sonoma, I think. Oh, uh, Sonoma now, uh, yeah. Cotati. Yeah. Cotati is Sonoma yeah. County. George yeah. Tischler was the founder. I worked with her office when they were in Santa Rafa about mm -hmm. God, 20 years ago. Yeah, they were in Santa They're doing great work. They're a wonderful organization. Mm -hmm. They're suing the state fair about the live animal market issue, in my Good. request. They're suing the state fair and the uh, California rodeo at Salinas. Mm -hmm. so, and you'll be happy to hear, I just found out yesterday, there's a, a sister firm in Canada called Animal Justice. And as of, I got, got a letter, they are suing a local fair about pig scrambles. Good. They say state and local ordinances say you cannot abuse and harm enough or whatever, so we can see you're sorry behind now. So I think I'm, I'm going to try to make that happen at Hayward uh -huh. and at Woodside. Great. If the politicians are not going to help us, and most of them all, they're just, sorry to say, most of them are prostitutes, their main goal is to be reelected. And an animals are way down the list. Whenever I go to Sacramento to talk to a legislator about an animal bill, I'll get assigned to the person who was last hired, quite often some 18-year-old kid. I said, did your mother know you're here? <laughs> These kids had never heard of Virginia, who's the most important animal advocate ever, ever in yeah. California. She's Virginia right up there. Virginia she's Hadley. right up there as yeah, Caesar Chavez yeah. in my book. Anyway, so we're making some headway there. So if I they're suing in Canada. But you know, it's interesting. Changing the law is important, but what's going to help change the law is changing people's minds, because it's the people who write the letters and make the calls and show yes. up and protest. So changing the mind of one person, just sh changing the mind of one person has a huge influence. It ripples. It ripples. I had no idea when I became a vegetarian that I would be running an education group for, to help other people become vegetarians. And I never, I, I have to be careful with the word never, because everything I said I'd never do, I, my life is a series of things I'd never do, but I was never gonna write a book, let alone a second book, let alone a third book. I wanna talk about my third book that's coming out this month, at oh, the end of the month. Please do. It's called Even Vegans Die. <gasps> And exactly, <laughs> but I, it's important. And again, it's the same co-authors. It's with Carol J. Adams and Virginia Messina has a master's in public health and is a registered dietitian. She's written a number of wonderful books. And the reason we wrote Even Vegans Die is because a lot of us become vegans for health reasons or vegetarians for health reasons. And it's true that the odds are improved, that your, your risk of heart disease, your risk of cancer, your risk of diabetes you, are lessened when you become a vegetarian or a vegan. But you never reduce the risk to zero. You reduce the risk significantly, but vegans still get heart disease, we still get cancer, we still get diabetes, we still get multiple sclerosis, we still get all kinds of things. But the promises people make is in their advocacy and in their ardency, they want so badly for people to become vegetarian that they will say, you'll never get sick, you'll never get a cold, mm -hmm. you gotta go vegan because then you'll always be healthy. Yeah. And then when someone does get sick, they feel like they failed personally, they <laughs> think they did something wrong. Yeah. So we wrote a whole book about how to show up for people who do get sick, how to care for one another, how to do caregiving in a way that doesn't shame people. We address body shaming and fat shaming and disease shaming and we talk about how to show up and care for ourselves and one another. We also encourage people to have wills because vegans think yeah. I'm gonna live forever. 
Hmm. And that's not true. <laughs> and then you're, there are your cats and dogs and other critters. That, right. Yeah. We have to take care of those and make yeah. sure we have plans. For if, if we're hit by a bus on the way home, even if we don't die, if we're hospitalized suddenly, who has the key to our apartment to get in and walk the dog, yeah. feed the cat? I mean, there are issues that vegans have to pay attention Big to. Time. You were speaking of all those diseases. My grandmother used to say, don't get ulcers, give them. <laughs> That's I do good. what I can, and she also She'd said. be proud of you. She said, "Persevere, and eventually, you wear the opposition down. Just stick with it long enough." And that's what we have to do is just hang in there. And here we are. Here we are. And I do think animal rights is a social justice issue. Yes. And like other social justice issues, there will be times when we look like we're making progress, and there'll be backsliding and more progress and backsliding. But I do think for every three steps forward, two steps back is still progress because you're gaining a step. Well, and, and like passing a, a law or convincing your congressman or something, if more and more and more people called them or wrote letters uh, and let them know that there's a lot of people out there who do care about the animals, mm -hmm. that, that would do it. We're so the biggest lobby in the country. Mm -hmm. Really, we are. Is that right? People who care about animals. So if you can convince people, hey, they don't have to even leave home if they would just sit down and write a, you know, two or three line letter right. to their to yeah. their congressman or senator yeah. or whatever. I've always said if the animals had a voice, a vote, or a dollar, it would be a different world. Absolutely. They have none of those. They have only us. And that's why it's so important that we speak up every time we right. see some kind of abuse. But there's cognitive cognitive dissonance in that people love their cats and dogs and lavish all kinds of attention on them and then give absolutely no attention whatsoever to the fact that there's a dead bird on their plate, or that mm -hmm. there are the ribs of a dead pig on their plate, or that they're eating the limbs or the, the flesh of a cow. And so we have to, there's a <clears> wonderful <throat> book I want to recommend by, um, I'll think of her name, Melanie Joy wrote a wonderful mm -hmm. book called Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. Yes. Mm -hmm. Melanie <clears throat> Joy, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows. And that book is fabulous because she explains that it's really just a matter of culture. Every culture has animals that are taboo to eat, and every culture has animals that are okay to eat, and it's different from one culture yes. to another. In Southeast yeah. Asia, they eat dogs, and they're, and, and they're appalled that we eat cows. <laughs> it's all perspective. It's all perspective. So when you realize it's a culturally taught, like you said, you have to be carefully taught. It's caught, taught through your culture. But she explains that every culture has a taboo list. Mm -hmm. And once you get that, you realize that there really is no difference between a dog and a pig or a dog and a, yeah. and a, a lamb. You're right. I agree. And I'm glad now, you brought up this cultural issue. Now, we only have a, a few more minutes. Okay. Uh, I'll take and, just a couple uh, So, then. no, I was just going to say that if there's something you want to be sure you mention. <laughs> well, well, I just speak over Patty. I mean, no, oh, no. <laughs> but you've been very good. Yes. So far. Uh, Patty, you talked about the cultural differences in animals. Virginia Hanley and I worked for 22 years, going to almost all the fish and game commissions around the state, trying to get them to do a ban on the importation of frogs and turtles for human consumption. You see them in all the live animal markets in Chinatown and Sacramento and Oakland and Los Angeles and San Francisco. Just all. We import every year to the state two million bullfrogs, mostly commercially raised in uh, Taiwan or Brazil or Mexico. Uh, they're not native to California. We also import about 300 to 400,000 freshwater turtles, all taken from the wild, from the wild, depleting local populations east of the Rockies for the most part. In the markets here, they're kept without food, without water, stacked four and five deep, butchered while fully conscious. We did about 25 necropsies on them, routinely found E. coli, salmonella, Pastorella, which will kill humans dead. Mm -hmm. It is illegal to sell such products for human consumption, but it goes on unchallenged because it's the, the Asian bloc mostly in San Francisco, and nobody wants to be called a racist. I've been called a Nazi in the Asian press for my troubles. So six years ago, the commission finally, and about gave me a heart attack, they voted five to nothing to stop the import. I said, Virginia, we finally won one. Two weeks later, uh, three Asian legislators Fiona Ma, Ted Lieu, now in Congress, and Leland Yee, now in jail, uh, called a special hearing to overturn what had just passed. Uh, meanwhile, they were challenged by uh, Commissioner Dan Richards, the guy who killed the mountain lion in Idaho, one of our best commissioners and my best friend on the board for this issue. Uh, the director of the department, John McCammon at the time, now gone, announced that he was going to continue issuing the permits but on a month-to-month -month basis. 
immediately challenged my Navy Commissioner Kellogg, Kellogg, not Kellogg, Richards, and said, what the hell do you mean? We told you five to nothing not to do this. And then the deputy director pipes up and says, well, the director acts at the pleasure of the governor. I said, what the hell are we, chop liver? Mm -hmm. I said, to heck with the governor. What happened to the democratic process? Are these hearings a waste of time? Of mine and yours, if you're going to do what you're going to do? This is not right. So they called a special hearing. It was packed. They bust in about 125 elderly Chinese from San Francisco who didn't know what we were talking about, didn't know the language at all. And Ted Lou, bless his, all three played the race card. And these are nice guys. They've always been a good animal votes, but this was a cultural issue. So they played the race card, and I was there. And when <laughs> Mr. Lou got through speaking, uh, Mr. Richards was on the phone. I said, sir, that's the most preposterous poppycock I've ever heard in my life. Jesus Christ. I about fell off my chair, and so did Ted. It, it was wonderful. Anyway, he's off to Congress now, but the Fish and Game Commission has agreed again to consider this a complete ban on these two groups of animals at their meeting in August, August, April 25th and 6th this month in Van Nuys. So I'm hoping we'll have a good turnout and encourage them. Uh, the biggest issue in all this for me is not only the cruelty and the health, but the majority of the bullfrogs test positive for the chytrid fungus. About 62% of them carry it. Mm -hmm. They don't succumb to it. That disease has caused the extinction of more than 200 species of frogs and other amphibians around mm -hmm. the world in the last mm -hmm. 25 years. It's, it's just a freaking nightmare. So they need to go, and certain religious groups buy them for Buddhist animal and liberation ceremonies, and do-gooders thinking they're doing a good thing. I got photographs of bullfrogs eating baby ducks, baby western pond turtles, spreading the disease. They don't die out of it. I wish they did, but they disperse to the others, like the red-legged and yellow-legged frogs, which are on the verge yeah. of losing. The way to save animals is to not eat them. It's not about buying them and releasing them into the wild. It's just that when the demand isn't there, they'll stop breeding them, and they'll stop That's abusing it. them, and they'll stop confining them and killing yeah. them. Well, we have reached um, probably the end of our time limit here. <laughs> I want to say that uh, we have been talking to uh, Patty Brightman, about uh, the vegetarian issues and many, many other animal issues, and Eric Mills, who has Action for Animals and a wonderful newsletter. So I'd like to close Public Advocate, and this is Shirley Graves. Thank you. Thank you.